That was the other thing we were told. You will not make money as an architect. If you want to make money, then you need to go somewhere else. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for setting up and running an architectural practice that allows you to do your best work more often. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Ryan Willard. So Ryan is our Director of Consulting here at Business of Architecture, and Ryan runs all of our group classes that we have as part of the Smart Practice Program, in addition to handling uh, the lion's share of the one-to-one work we do with firms, uh, in both in coaching, consulting, and mentoring. So Ryan, uh, it's glad to have you here on the show. Ryan also happens to run. You'll hear him interview here for the BOA Global Podcast, as well as Ryan is the exclusive host of the Business of Architecture UK podcast, of course, because as you may know, Ryan Willard is uh, based out of London. So Ryan and I, we met back in, I guess we met in person in 2018, but before that, you had reached out and uh, we started collaborating on the podcast before we actually even started working together yeah, here at Business it, of Architecture. It, about 2015, I have that LinkedIn message I sent you. Framed. Yeah, do you remember? Yeah. T- tell us about that because there may be some other aspiring podcasters who would like to run a podcast and they, they just may be sitting on the sidelines and we want to encourage them to reach out to us. Maybe they could be the next Ryan Willard. But what? tell us that little story here just to start us off. Um. I was running my own business at the time, architecture practice, and I had the idea that I wanted to talk to other architects about how they were running their own businesses and what they were doing. And I'd been listening to Business of Architecture. I'd done a couple of Business of Architecture programs. It wasn't Business of Architecture program. It was uh, one of the one of the web design programs that you'd done with Eric. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. back in 2013, yeah. I think I'd purchased yeah. one of those courses and worked yeah. my way through it and yeah. had thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so I've been listening to the, the podcast and I thought, well, I'd love to interview architects. Why don't I record these interviews and then perhaps turn it into a podcast? And rather than create a podcast from scratch, I was like, well, I've been listening to this guy, Enoch. I wonder if he'd be interested in perhaps taking these podcasts on or taking these interviews and publishing them on his platform it would be a lot easier for me and I had a business mentor at the time who uh, thoroughly encouraged that idea and so I reached out to you and sent a message saying explaining the idea you promptly responded and the next day we were talking on Skype I think it was back in those days And um, you gave me some ideas about what kind of podcasting equipment to go and do and go and use. And that was the start, really. And then I just started inviting people to be interviewed. Um, And then it quickly grew into a bit of an obsession and was starting to produce was starting to produce quite a few podcast episodes. And then after a few years, that's when we decided that we would uh, found the business of architecture uk absolutely and then what i flew over there with my wife i think it was 2018 we had the launch the launch for that uh you got a wonderful venue promoted i think we had over 300 attendees there uh, yeah, prominent architects a, a great panel discussion yeah it was a it was a fantastic evening yeah and we did was... those we did a number of those live events um and that was the that was the beginning and then and then we were kind of cut out a little bit during covid so live events kind of mm-hmm. went out of went weren't permitted anymore and then uh, our working relationship got deeper and deeper indeed until, yes until we here we are today yes with your penetrating insights ryan and as a matter of fact ryan's ryan's going to be over here in the us here coming up this year so there will be some seminars and workshops we'll be running so if you all would want to meet ryan in person uh, and you live in the u.s that uh, should be an opportunity to do that yeah very excited about doing that yeah ryan okay ryan so we're here to talk about this idea that you and i've been talking about behind the scenes which is the the cult of design and instead of giving a lot of preamble about this what we're going to do is we're going to jump right into a manifesto that Ryan has has written about this, and then we'll discuss it. And you may wonder, okay, Enoch, Ryan, what is the cult of design? Well, buckle in your seatbelt, and we're just going to turn the time over to Ryan here, and he's going to jump right into reading off this manifesto about the cult of design and the impact that we're seeing that it has currently and it has had in the past on the profession and practice of architecture. Ryan, over to you. 
Thank you very much. So the cult of design. Design is wonderful and empowering, but the cult of design is manipulative, destructive, and has been at the source of the loss of agency of architects for a long time. And we, we're the only ones responsible. Not politics, not gender, not the RABA, not the AIA, but us architects. We are responsible. The cult of design includes warped perversions, usually indoctrinated into us at university. Now, this wouldn't be so bad if it was a regular degree that lasted for three years with normal hours, but we know that architecture is one of the longest degrees at seven years uh, in general for its complete training with lengthy hours. If you look at any of the statistics, you will see that architecture um, degree programs tend to have the most hours of lectures and people obviously sitting inside their studios. So this is a long degree, a long period with long time frames on a daily basis that goes in to the brainwashing which begins early and we get deluded with the following. Portfolio is everything. The result of prolonged exposure to a bizarrely weighted education system where design takes preference over everything and where academics celebrate all constraints and their possibilities to inspire architectural invention except we do not celebrate business, finance or commercialism. This is completely negated, creating an architectural culture that is obsessed with artistic integrity but lacks the agency in many cases to even get that type of work realised. We become hypercritical of others to the point of pessimism and only design is ever considered. We blame everyone else, clients, the economy, other industries for our low fees but we accept little to no responsibility and we expect the ROBA and the AIA to constantly save us. We've created a culture where the reality of design's importance is warped and, large, and largely hyperbole, and it negates the problem-solving ability of the architect in their real-world service. We have a culture of architecture where we're obsessed with drawings as the motivating force of architecture, to use a Peter Cook quote, but most people can't read drawings, care for them, or even understand them, even your contractors. Go and check the top universities for the garbled theoretical musings that pour out. They may be beautiful, but do they make any sense? Money is the motivating force of architecture, not drawings. There are numerous sacrifices made in the cult of design in the name of the god of design. Innocent employees, architects themselves, our relationships, our mental health, our well-being and of course, profit and our bank accounts. We will defend architecture as a way of thinking and looking at the world, certainly when we're looking at it and considering it as a degree, but we hate on the idea of teenagers being made to study, for example, in the UK here, a recent proposal from our Prime Minister, we hate the idea of teenagers being made, made to study mathematics all the way through up until university, which... Isn't that also a language that helps us to think and problem solve? In the cult of design, we become impotent financially. We can't get it up. We aren't invited to the table. We're seen as aesthetes. And well, this is what happens when you ignore finance. Because guess what? Money creates architecture. Societal issues, not architectural ones, become distractions of business incompetence. Climate change, inclusion, gender, all interesting and important things, but in many cases, architects with little to no agency are taking the route of activism before they've grown a mature business that can make an impact. Clients come second, sometimes last, and are often viewed to do battle with or as an obstruction to doing me, my work, and we always consider that design is always inherently virtuous. That's what I've got with that so far. <laughs> All right, Ryan. Well, where should where should we start uh, in terms of 
Well, Look, I, I think a little, a little bit of context is needed. Let's let's add well. the context, and, please. And also to consider this is a a kind of work in progress of of ideas and of thoughts that we've been talking about for the for a long time here, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and yeah. you know, kind of. Uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of commentary on on a lot of things, you know, that are actually quite nuanced and complicated, uh, and and I and I want this to be something that's starting conversation, and the the wider context, if you like, is it's good to consider the wider context of the cult of design. So when we work at when we work with businesses here at Business of Architecture, we'll often start with what we call the four cancers of an architecture business. Number one is the cult of design, which is this paradigm, this cult, this culture, if you like, that has been in many cases un unintentionally created um, as a result of our long gestation period as architects. Then we've got other things like overwhelm, stress, burnout. We see that happening, the bottleneck, people working crazy long hours, um, exhausted teams, low salaries, etc. All of that contributes to overwhelm, stress and burnout. Then we've got lack of money, lack of profit, lack of resource, lack of time. And then the other, the final ailment of an architecture business is the wrong team, the wrong people. Okay, so the cult of design sits in these four um, these kind of four illnesses of an architecture business and often what we're doing in the smart practice is creating pillars which actually are the antidotes to some of these things and we found it very useful to start to describe the the cult of design um, so that we can become aware of it All right so that's one of the that's one of the intentions of this conversation mm -hmm. so yeah. In there, there's you know there's there's quite a lot of quite a lot of things. And I think one thing that I would also add to this cult of design is that um, I'm not against architectural education by any means. I think it's incredibly powerful, rewarding, and a fantastic education and just a fantastic set of tools and skills that you that you get learned. And I've been very privileged to be able to go through that experience myself. But I would say that we're starting to see architectural ways of thinking and skill sets being better rewarded in disciplines and professions outside of architecture. So people with architecture degrees or architectural training kind of changing or getting off the career path and working at other sorts of design companies, working in um, user experience, working in film, um, and this is this at university is very can be a very exciting and intoxicating idea, and depending on what industry you move into, those skills can be much better remunerated. And then in architecture, as an industry itself, the training that you get, you don't need it. It's not used. Largely, yeah. It's largely not used. And then we also had the other problem of the architects, people going into the architecture industry don't have the skills that are needed to be an architect. They don't have the construction knowledge, they don't have the practical knowledge, they don't understand how buildings are actually put together, they've got no idea about how the world of finance works and operates and how that's gauging things. There's no idea about the client. None of this, none of this real life stuff and it's often the universities are like, well, you know, you'll learn that at when you're working, okay? It's not the place here. But it's yeah. it's a bit backwards because, well, hold on a minute. Why the hell would you not consider money and finance in architecture school? Because you're safe. You keep talking about it being a safe environment to test all these wonderful design ideas. Well, why not test out financial ones and business ideas in the safety of like, you know, no one's putting any money down except for the money they're paying for the course. So it's very interesting when I speak to people like um, Geronimo at the um, in Madrid at the at the MBA of Masters of Architecture, and you know that they're they're getting their students to really consider um, using the safety of university to 
to consider different business models and ways that architecture practices can make money and starting to look and explore at very deep level the commercial side of of running a business i think that's massively important because what ends up happening when we go through our education negating business then we've inadvertently created this cult of design where design is everything and people make these crazy crazy sacrifices for it and it doesn't actually further great design it becomes a bit of a, a handbrake to it yeah fascinating ryan so what we have here is we have a lot a, a lot of symptoms of problematic things in the industry that we know are problems and that these problems have very severe and real consequences on our lives uh, let me give you an example. So right now, there is a shortage of mid-career professionals in the architecture industry, right? Uh, I would say at least half of the of the client firms that are in our smart practice program right now, like most of the firms out there, are looking to hire someone that is further along than right out of school. They're looking for that sweet spot of someone maybe 10 to 12 years out of school that can basically take over a project and to finish, uh, start to finish and uh, be able to pull that off successfully. But what happened is that we have these cycles in architecture. So let's go back. There's, there's the cyclical nature of architecture where we have these massive layoffs because the economy crashes. And then all these architectural practices spend the next year or two or three years digging themselves out of the hole, right? Now, it is true that there are forces way beyond the control of us as architects in the economy. However, there are certain things within that realm of context that we do have control over. And these are the things that we see that it's very easy to ignore or to be blind to or to not pay attention to or not take responsibility for because we are so enamored with the cult of design. So for instance, the need to make a profit, right? I know many architects feel, and there seems to be this unspoken ethos or culture that having a profit in an architectural practice, first of all, isn't the point of architecture. That's another topic discussion there. Uh, but that it's not even necessarily that important, right? Like if we're just making enough money to pay the bills and we're just getting by, then everything is good, right? This, ig this is an ignorant and shallow viewpoint because what it doesn't take into account is that a proper functioning and a, a well-funded practice has the ability to buffer itself against the cyclical nature of architecture. It has the ability to hire and keep on the best employees. It has the ability to pivot in the case there is some sort of downturn. So a well-run business, by and large, is going to be the most well-protected in the case of these cycles that happen in architecture. And so what we're missing out on when we think that, you know what, I'm making enough money, air quotes, right? Oh, we're just making enough money, is yes, we're making enough money for the current model that we're running, which for many small practices is the model of, I'm basically trading my time for money. I, I have I have built myself a job and I'm ignoring any sort of long-term marketing approach just because we don't need to. Uh, I'm ignoring to a large extent any sort of staff development. Uh, I'm ignoring the ability to be able to refine the way that we present our value to clients. And so then we have a whole bunch of other side effects, which is clients telling us that we're too expensive. And then we end up lowering our fees because we start to believe the narrative that indeed clients don't value what we do. And it's just this huge cycle that continually feeds on itself, which ultimately creates a lot of the structural problems that, that so many people are outraged about in the industry of architecture. And when we, when we take that thread and when we look at that thread and we take it all the way back to the root, what we find is this, this obsession, this worship of the cult of design. And so that's the context for the conversation that we're having here today. I think it's very interesting. Like, let's, let's consider what a cult does, right? A cult takes you away from your family. It can warp your ideas. It can impoverish you. Right? It, it generally has these kind of quite negative 
impacts, right? And it you kind become of fanatical you. about it. Yeah, you, you become, become fanatical irrational, about it. <laughs> ir- ir- irrational about the way that you approach life and relationships and obsession with this particular thing. Yeah. Um, and when we and again, like I was like I was saying in the in the document there, like we end up making these sacrifices in the name of the cult. Yes. And yeah. I think you know one one of them as well is is as we're talking about money, and then we have we develop um, a way of dealing with the lack of finance as being an architect, which kind of softens the reality of it. And I think we're starting to mm-hmm. see as well, you know. We talk about more agency and having more diversity in the architecture field, but you know the 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 prospects are not great for someone to spend that amount of money. If you just look at it as an ROI, a return on your investment, um, people, you know, spending all that money for seven years of university education to be getting paid. A salary which is the equivalent of a manager of a McDonald's. No disrespect to anybody who manages a McDonald's. Mm-hmm. It's a good, mm-hmm. it's a very good yeah, franchise. definitely not. We want to respect right? all you, our McDonald's it, workers. It, it, it's, but it's what it's kind of saying there is that you know I was I was looking at this as you know t- the time it takes to become a McDonald's manager. Now, somebody who's reasonably intelligent can become a, a manager of a McDonald's. This is not an owner, by the way. This is a manager of one of these outlets within the space of, you know, two years or so, if you're reasonably bright and be getting paid at uh, an equivalent rate of a newly qualified architect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, right. we, we, we get brought up again with this other idea of, you know, follow your passion. Mm-hmm. And if you follow your passion, then you'll never work a day in your life. And if you do what you love, then everything's going to be okay. And I feel like this is this is not the whole truth. Mm, mm. And this is and this is one of these ideas that's deeply baked into the cult of design. And when I Absolutely. when I first went to university, the first day of architecture school, I remember they all they stood us all up, and they said, you know, there was a hundred of us or one hundred and twenty of us, and they said only thirty of you are going to become mm. architects. So they've already created this sense of scarcity and the sense of like most of you are never going to make it. And then they would. Then they spoke about architecture as a vocation. It's a calling. It's something that you feel deep in your soul. This is sounding very much like a cult, <laughs> right? It's a, it's something that's it's something that's calling you, and that you're never going to make a lot of money as an architect. That was yeah. the other thing we were told. You will not yeah. make money as an architect. If you want to make money, then you need to go somewhere else. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that kind of justified the whole next seven years. And rather than kind of owning up and perhaps saying, we don't know how to make money as an architect, mm. Mm. but there are people who do, mm. that, was never, that was never a conversation. But rather the conversation then led for another seven years of money and great design are incompatible. Mm. Ryan, I see this is this is it's interesting how this how closely this this just matches human nature. In other words, when there's when we have a perceived lack or deficiency, it's human nature to blame everyone but ourselves. In other words, not to take responsibility for the thing that we're looking at. And the crazy part is that when you really look at it, when you look about any situation or any negative impact that we're experiencing in life, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter who's responsible. It doesn't matter who's responsible. It doesn't. There's no blame. There's no fault. There's blame, fault, shame, feelings of inadequacy. These are all perceptions and interpretations of the human mind, right? And so, what ultimately ends up happening is that we start to live out our life uh, based upon a narrative, right? And one of the narratives is: if I go through architecture school and my professors tell me that we can't make money in this profession, and why do they say that? Well, we don't know. We need a psychologist to figure that out. Uh, probably based upon their experience, right? But there's this vicious cycle where let's let's just say, and I remember this from my early days um, as a businessman, uh, I understood that the problem was that I just didn't know how to make money. I understood that making money was a skill, and I also understood that I didn't know how to do it. 
And the, the wonderful part is that making money is a skill that can be applied to any, any, any business. Uh, you know, the principles for making money are going to be the same for a plumber as they are for an architect, as they are for an attorney, as they are for a restaurant owner. The principles, the application of those may be very, very different. But the actual principles that drive the production of money, uh, that the exchange of goods and services for money is they're, they're indisputable laws. They're laws, they're principles, they're well documented. There's hundreds of business books about this. And, you know, it's the, the foundation for what we teach in smart practice is the very, the very basics of these foundations. Now, what, what we become blind to and why this can be so damaging is because of the unseen impacts that this overall culture has on us as people and as architects. And um, let me give an example. Ryan, I was talking with one of our one of our clients recently, and one of the things that we focus on in smart practice is a focus on what we call the core four areas of life. So it's not just what we found is that every area of life is connected. So our, our relationships at home, we call that balance. Our health and fitness, we call that our body. Our relationship with ourself, so a personal sense of self, purpose, passion, and also a relationship with the higher power, we call that the being. And then lastly, business. So there's four key areas body, balance, being, and business. And what's interesting is that a lot of times we, we compartmentalize these things and we say, okay, my life is doing great. I'm having a lot of success in the business quadrant. I'm making lots of money. We're doing good projects. That's on fire. And it's very, the trap here is that it's so easy to be doing well in one of these areas and then ignoring the other areas. And so what we see is we see people, their health is deteriorating, right? So we see them g- gaining weight. We see them, their energy levels are dropping. They're not sleeping well at night. They're sacrificing their health. They're sacrificing their relationship. They're sacrificing their mental sanity, well-being on the altar of the cult of design. In other words, to do work that we love, we believe that it's necessary to sacrifice these things. All right. So we're going to go ahead and cut this episode right here. I hope you enjoyed this conversation that Ryan and I had about a very, very important topic Tune in next week for our next continued segment on the cult of design. And that's a wrap. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because You see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.